election day in Texas for the March 1st primary. Let's take a live look from Sky 12 over one of the many polling sites. This one, Brook Hollow Library, polls open for one more hour. Exactly 279 polling locations open right now throughout Bear County. And as Myra just said, they will close at 7 o'clock. If you are still in line, though, at 7, you will be allowed to vote. The Bear County Elections Office staff working hard to make sure everything is going smoothly in Bear County. Only about 42,000 out of the more than a million registered voters in Bear County turned out to vote today. Our Patty Santos joins us live now from the county's election headquarters. So, Patty, how are things looking out there with an hour left? Yeah, the election headquarters, you can actually vote here in the last couple of hours. We have seen traffic pick up. If you're standing in line at these, this precinct or any precinct, you by 7 o'clock, you will be able to vote tonight. But election officials say that an average primary brings in about 47,000 voters, and that's even a low number. Officials don't think they're going to get to that number tonight. And there have also been some issues with mail-in ballots. About 35% of those ballots have been rejected in the past, and uh, the past rejection rate was about 2 to 3%. If your mail-in ballot was rejected and you received a letter in the mail, you can take that letter to a polling location and you're going to be able to vote. There are seven forms of ID that you can take to vote tonight. Uh, those include a driver's license, a handgun license, a passport or naturalization document, among others. And remember, you can vote at any precinct that you want. And if they go to one that has a, a line, which we, which we would hope, please tell your viewers that at every site, if they walk up to somewhere by the door, is a posting that says these are the four nearest vote centers to you. And get this, the precinct with the highest voters tonight is in the north side. That's at Brook Hollow uh, a Library. And the site with the lowest voter turnout right now only had about 15 voters as of 4 o'clock. That is on the east side, Perales Elementary. We're going to stay here on the scene, bring you more updates from the elections office. We expect another update around 730. We'll bring it to you. We'll send it back to you. All right, Patty, we will see you soon. The race for Bear County judge is a race to watch tonight. A big one. The Democratic primary looks right for a runoff election, having drawn some relatively well-known local names, but not all of them have experience as candidates. Our Garrett Berger joins us live from the Bear County Courthouse for us this evening. All right, Garrett, so tell us about what's drawing them in. Well, longtime county judge Nelson Wolf is stepping down at the end of this term. That leaves his seat leading county government open. That's a golden opportunity for anybody trying to get in without having to unseat an incumbent first. Now, there are four candidates in the Democratic race, and that's Wolf's party. Gerardo Ponce, who was previously run for mayor, Ina Minjares, a current state rep, Ivales Meza Gonzalez, who was most recently Mayor Nuremberg's chief of staff, and Peter Sakai, a former district court judge. Now, three have run for office before, but this is Mesa Gonzalez's first campaign. It's been great, um, been really good. We've been working really hard for the last three months, and today's the last day voters um, can come out and vote for the candidate that they are most connected to, that they uh, feel is going to represent their county in the best way, and I hope they pick me. We reached out to the other three candidates this afternoon, but we were not able to get them on camera. However, we did talk on the phone with Gerardo Ponce, who was confident about his chances. Now on the Republican side, Trish DeBerry, who, who dropped her spot as Precinct 3 Commissioner in order to run for judge, is facing off against Nate Buchanan. Now we're going to have a, we're going to have a clear victor on that side, one way or the other. Live at the Bear County Courthouse, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Three Democrats with big ideas for Texas House District 124. That covers West Bear County. The district will have new representation because, as you saw, Representative Ina Minjadas is running for county judge. Courtney Friedman at the Lions Field polling location where she says voters still have time to choose one of those three candidates in the race. Courtney joins us live. Courtney. Yeah, and here at Lionsfield north of downtown, there is still a long line of people just with less than an hour, and that's a good sign for these candidates because 
This is a very important primary for them, considering historically this district leans towards the Democrats. So what happens here is crucial. Let's go over who we're looking at tonight for these Democrat, these Democratic candidates. The race is between defense attorney Stephen Gilmore, Air Force veteran turned advocate, Josie Garcia and NISD school board member Gerald Lopez. I met up with all three of them today earlier to ask them before the polls close what issues they consider most important. All three mentioned either criminal justice reform or police reform. I understand the unique issues that people who are uh, impoverished deal with whenever they have to go through the criminal justice system because all of my practice, almost all of my practice is indigent defense. Fighting for police accountability is we've made headway. We have hope because we've opened conversations that we don't think would have happened otherwise. I am for public safety. I'm for our police officers. I'm for our firefighters. I'm not for defunding the police. We've got to maintain the basic necessities that our, that our citizens want. Yeah, the winner of this primary will face Republican Johnny Arredondo, which currently in this primary is running unopposed. We're live from Lions Field. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. All right, thank you, Courtney. In the 28th Texas Congressional District, two women trying to unseat nine-term incumbent Henry Cuellar. He is the conservative Democrat who has kept that seat since 2005. His campaign chances shaken up, though, after the FBI raided his home in January. Political analysts say the progressive Democrat Jessica Cisneros has a solid chance of winning this race, especially with endorsements by big-name advocates like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Elizabeth Warren. Tanya Benavidez is the third Democratic candidate. She is against the border wall, wants to expand Medicare and make public education more equitable. It is a wide open race to represent much of North Barra County at the Texas House. Four Republican candidates vying to replace Representative Lyle Larson. Larson not seeking re-election in this conservative leaning district. Dylan Collier joins us live now from Fair Oaks Ranch with what the candidates are saying on this election day. And this is one of those races we're going to be paying very close attention to, Dylan. And Steve, two of these candidates are political newcomers. None have ever held an office of this magnitude, but it's clear whoever advances to represent the Republican ticket will be more conservative than Larson, who has held this office since 2010. Larson has also been known in recent years to go against party leadership in Austin on some issues. That will unlikely be the case if any of these four candidates win in November. Well, look, I think at the end of the day, there, there's a lot more that we can work on together on both sides of the aisle than we can. But there's also a lot of our core conservative values in this community that we got to stand firm on. Lyle Larson had, he had some good ideas on, on water and, and uh, we hope to continue that. Uh, but I would be more socially conservative than Lyle. When it comes to votes and, and legislative priorities, I am more conservative. Um, and so I know he's taken some tough votes that were against the, the, the bulk of the rest of the Republican party. I'd probably be more in line with where the Republican party is going. And we were unable to connect today with the campaign for Alyssa Chan, a social conservative and a one-time San Antonio City Council member with no incumbent and four people on the Republican side. This race could very well be headed for a runoff in late May. Reporting live in Fair Oaks Ranch, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. All right, thanks, Dylan. Another reminder, polling locations open until 7 o'clock tonight. There are more than 200 places to choose from. If you need to see a sample ballot beforehand, any other information on the candidates, scan the QR code you see right here or go to ksat.com. We have an article that breaks down all you need to know. And then after the polls close right at 7, maybe closer to 705, we're going to start our breakdown election live stream. We're going to speak with political experts about what they are seeing in tonight's results, along with some candidates. And we have numbers, numbers, numbers all night. You can watch that online at ksat.com. Other big stories today, something we've been talking about for months. It is finally here. The CPS energy rate increase. It went into effect today. That rate increased by 3.85% with more rate hikes planned over the next five years. CPS Energy's officials say this will add an additional $3.84 to the average residential customer's monthly bill, along with an average of $1.26 per month in the fuel adjustment portion of your bill as well. 
San Antonio police are looking for a suspect who allegedly shot at a moving car while parked in their own car. The shooting actually happened on Rain Tree Forest, not far from Tupperwine and Lookout Roads on the northeast side. Police say a car with three people inside shot at several times. The backseat passenger hit in the leg. The driver able to get home and call for help. The passenger shot taken to Bamsey. The two other people in the vehicle were not hit. University Health announcing the closure of the Wonderland of the Americas vaccination site today. Just the announcement today, the last day to get vaccinated there is this Friday. Doors close there at 6 o'clock on Friday. After 14 months in operation, University Health says that more than 500,000 COVID-19 shots have been administered there. Remember, you can still get vaccinated through pop-up clinics and pharmacy locations as well. For a list of all the locations around town, go to ksat.com. Check out the weather right now, 70 degrees. It has been bright sunshine, a beautiful Election Day Tuesday. Yeah, beautiful day, comfortable day, a lot of sunshine. Uh, overall, just a wonderful day, especially with low humidity. Now, it was cold earlier today. We started at 33 officially in San Antonio, measured at the airport, of course. That's well below the average low of 48. And this afternoon, we topped out at 72 degrees, which is just two degrees above average. You look at high temperatures today and at Rock Springs 46. That's obviously an error in the readings there. But Catula made it to 78, 75 for the high temperature in Del Rio and Kerrville 71. You look at the readings now. We're just a few degrees shy of our highs today. New Braunfels now at 70. Pleasant in 71, and for the most part, a mixture of upper 60s to low 70s around town. A 69 in Comfort, 72 right now in Casterville. This evening, temperatures falling off efficiently. Will be mid 50s by 10 o'clock. Have a jacket handy even for tomorrow morning. We'll talk about the rest of the week, increasing humidity and what that means for some dampness straight ahead. All right, thanks, Adam. Russian troops escalating their attacks in Ukraine. The lives already lost and what other countries are doing now in hopes to bring this to an end. And tonight is the State of the Union and will all eyes be on Ukraine? We're going to speak with a local political expert to break down what we can expect tonight. Let's take a look here at traffic. This is the Transguide camera I-35 and Wiener. You can see there is a crash there on the shoulder. We've got some emergency vehicles on the scene there, certainly slowing things down. Looks like one lane, possibly two blocked there. Something to keep in mind at I-35 in Wiener. For President Joe Biden, tonight's State of the Union address will not only be his first, it could also be one of the most important speeches of his presidency. And expected to be front and center, of course, is Ukraine. Our Jesse DeGoyado tells us tonight's speech comes at a time when Americans and the president have even more on their minds. Who decided to schedule a Russian-Ukrainian war, a State of the Union address, and the Texas primary all on the same day? Perhaps the chair of the UTSA Department of Political Science and Geography feels somewhat like President Joe Biden with a lot going on at the same time ahead of his first State of the Union address. Russia escalating the war in Ukraine. Its president, Vladimir Putin, threatening to use a nuclear option if necessary, even as consumers here struggle to keep up with ever-rising inflation, pushing President Biden's poll numbers down even further, while Congress remains firmly divided. How do you strike a positive note when, it, when you're in such a negative or adverse situation? And that's, I think, where Biden's gonna really have to thread the needle Taylor says take Ukraine, for example. The vast majority of Americans are outraged with what's happened with the Russian invasion. He says they want to know how will the United States respond short of sending American troops to Ukraine, and yet... The average American is also going to be wondering about, okay, what's this going to do to my, my pocketbook? What's this going to do to my gas tank in terms of going, going to the grocery store? Still, Taylor says it's possible Ukraine could offset some of what's working against Biden. Presidents can show their strength in foreign policy by, by being decisive. If so, Taylor says the State of the Union could be both historic and a way to save his presidency. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. Speaking of UTSA, Professor John Taylor, he's going to be one of the guests during our election night live stream tonight. Our election night breakdown begins at 7. It can be found on all the KSAT streaming platforms. All right, weather, not a concern for any campaign today. That's certainly not stopping anybody from getting out there and voting. Beautiful out there. 
Yeah, beautiful to get outside and just do whatever you want to do outdoors as well. And this evening, if you are outside, just have that jacket ready to go because as that sun sets, it gets dark outside, temperatures are going to fall off pretty quickly. Warmer mornings, though, are on the way. Our nights and early mornings, those temperatures will be on the upswing with some increasing humidity. They're directly correlated. And then oak pollen. It returned to the pollen count today. Right when we get rid of mountain cedar, it's hello oak. Take a look at our pollen count. I want to point that out. It's low, but it's the first time that it's registered in the pollen count and low at a count of 10. And I want to point out that oak season usually peaks in early April around here. That's typically when we see about the peak of oak season. So just get ready for it. This is just the beginning. Here's a look at our sky. Just some mid-level clouds out there. Really a beautiful evening. 68 right now. A dew point of 18, so still very dry air in place. A lack of any humidity or real mugginess in the air. But the southerly wind is going to increase. That's going to change our humidity. Temperatures right now across the state, 60s and 70s. Really not a big variation from 67 in Dallas to 73 El Paso. 66 in Brownsville and Laredo right now at 75 degrees. We're official 70 in Hondo and currently 73 in Del Rio. As we fast forward to tomorrow morning, I do think temperatures for the most part will be right around the 40 degree mark. And then by tomorrow afternoon, we make it back into the 70s. Now our morning temperatures will be changing near 40 tomorrow, mid 40s on Thursday. And then notice by Friday into the weekend, we see those morning temperatures back into the 50s and 60s. That's a direct result of higher humidity levels, the higher dew points really, and more moisture back in the air. So I mentioned that lack of mugginess, dew points teens to right near 20 degrees, but the wind off the Gulf of Mexico is going to kick in throughout the week gradually, and that's going to increase those dew points and the overall moisture content of our air, which will get into a trend of morning fog and drizzle. So starting on Thursday, we're going to start the trend of daily fog and drizzle and just overall dampness for the morning hours, you know, usually up until about 10 a.m. or noon. And that's especially going to be the case Friday, Saturday, all the way into Sunday. And actual noticeable mugginess back in the air, kind of a spring like feel by Sunday, uh, Saturday and Sunday, when you feel that humidity and actually notice it out there. Quiet weather pattern right now is very weak insignificant upper level low over Tucson, Arizona and Phoenix area. That's throwing a little bit of mid-level moisture over parts of Texas. That's generally staying to the north of us. So this big plume of moisture coming on shore in the West Coast, particularly the Pacific Northwest. That's that atmospheric river that we talked about yesterday. A lot of moisture with that. I wish we could tap into it, but unfortunately, that's not going to be headed to our direction. There is going to be an overall shift in the pattern that could favor precipitation for other parts of Texas, but not necessarily around here in the days ahead. We still have a slight chance here and there. Sunday, about a 20% chance of a stray shower or storm even. And then Monday and Tuesday, a 20 to 30% chance of a few stray showers. Just unfortunately, our pattern's not really looking all that good in terms of real beneficial rain. Tomorrow, nothing but sunshine, 40 in the morning. Mid 70s by the afternoon. As I mentioned, the morning dampness starts on Thursday. It's that nuisance dampness that it reduces visibility, makes everything a little wet outside in the morning, but doesn't really add up to anything and isn't really beneficial. That's every Thursday or every morning, Thursday through the weekend. A weak cold front hits on Monday. That'll reset our temperatures from the low 80s this weekend back down into the 60s by early next week. All right. Thank you, Adam. All right. It is. Something the Cowboys kind of kept under the radar, but we're finding out more about what's going on with their starting quarterback, Greg. Yeah, you say Dak Prescott and you say surgery and everybody's yeah. ears perk up, especially after what happened in the 2020 season. When we come back, we'll give you an update on that and what it looks like or will he be able to participate in any offseason workouts. And a three-time NBA champion now wants a state title when we come back. Football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Cowboys star quarterback Dap Prescott is recovering from surgery on his non throwing shoulder. That was revealed by Cowboys head coach Mike McCarthy today. McCarthy confirmed it was on his left shoulder and should not affect Prescott's availability for their offseason program. McCarthy added that the injury was an irritant to Prescott during last season but does not believe it impacted the quarterback's play. Some may argue that point since Prescott played differently than what he did in the first six games of the season where he looked invincible, setting the franchise record with 37 touchdown passes after missing only one game with a calf injury.
All right, San Antonio Spurs have just 20 games left in the regular season, and after last night's loss in Memphis, they have dropped now to a game and a half behind the New Orleans Pelicans, who own the 10th and playing spot in the Western Conference. And Pop is still two wins away from being the NBA's all-time winningest coach with a chance to pass Don Nelson if the Spurs win their home game against Sacramento on Thursday and a quick road trip to Charlotte on Saturday. But that's after they have to shake off the beating Ja Morant delivered for the Grizzlies last night. He was unstoppable. First, this poster dunk over Jakob Pertl that came in the second half, second quarter, should say, that everybody's talking about during a over a seven-footer. But he outdid himself when he delivered this buzzer beater of a full-court pass from Stephen Adams from behind the backboard to give Memphis a 10-point lead at the half. Lonnie Walker, the four, tried to keep the Spurs in this game with 22, but Morant was on fire, scoring a career-high and franchise-high 52 points in the 118-105 victory. What are we holding to? <laughs> what? 52? Well, you know, I'm a little angry. I thought we, if we held him like in the 40s, we'd be okay. No, he's a beautiful player. I mean, you know, what else can you say about him? But it's not just that he's athletic. And everybody says, hey, he's athletic. Somebody says, you know, he's a freak of nature, you know, because he's so fast. And he's a, you know, you combine that cerebral part of his game with the athleticism and you got a special kid. Sure do. Well, next up for the Spurs, they host the Sacramento Kings. That's to be Thursday at 7.30 back in the AT&T Center. Now that Bruce Bowen has helped the Spurs win three of their five NBA championships to go along with his eight all-defensive teams and having his number 12 retired in the Raptors of the AT&T Center, now he's trying to get the TMI Panthers a state championship as their head coach. Panthers have made it all the way to the TAPS 5A state semifinals where they face Conroe, the Woodlands Christian. I'm thrilled that our kids have this opportunity to be recognized as, you know, one of the top teams in the state. This has been, I mean, a moment I've been waiting for for four years since I've been playing varsity. I haven't had a state run yet, uh, ever. So in this upcoming game, you know, got, got a lot to win for. All right, game time for TMI on Friday at Robinson High School in Waco is set for noon. Meantime, a big send-off this afternoon for the Young Men's Leadership Academy as the Lions depart Wheatley and head for Goliad, where they'll face Kingsville at 7 in the third round of the Class 4A area basketball playoffs tonight. It's like a dream come true. You know, uh, we've been waiting years for this, uh, especially last year when we got uh, knocked down the second round. So it's, it feels good, you know, to be in this position right now. It's honestly pretty nerve-wracking because in the playoffs, it could be my last game at any point, and I just, I just don't want it to end yet. All right, and here's a look at the games we have available tonight on the BGC app, courtesy of TSP, Texas Sports Productions, Clark and Westlake at San Marcos at 7, Veterans Memorial against Liberty Hill and Buda at Hayes High School at 7, at 8 o'clock, Somerset on the road against Rio Hondo at Alice High School. So we'll have those highlights for you tonight on the Night Beat. All right, busy night. You got it. Thank you, Greg. Our KSAP Q&A is up next. All right, it is Election Day turning into election night, less than 30 minutes to get out and cast your ballot if you have not yet. And there are a lot of people who have not yet. And that's one of the things I want to talk about with a political columnist for the San Antonio Express News, Gilbert Garcia. Gilbert, thank you for joining us, taking time out on what's going to be a busy night. Is the low turnout one of the stories that you're going to have in the paper tomorrow? Yeah, I think that it is. And we've there have been a lot of stories in Texas. There was actually a big Washington Post story today about the problem with mail ballots um, because of SB1, which the legislature passed last year, it's, it's it imposed some strict uh, identification requirements on mail ballots. There was a story in there about a 75-year-old Houstonian who has uh, poor eyesight and would have said he would have preferred to have voted by mail, but was nervous that it was not going to be accepted, so he went and voted in person. So I think that that's definitely a part of the, a big part of the story. I mean, ultimately, I think our turnout numbers in Bear County will be probably be similar to what we had in 2018. Uh, the last midterm election, but our population has grown since then. So I think the numbers are disappointing for the elections department. And you talk about mail-in ballots, just to, to dovetail off that, uh, our Patty Santos was reporting that usually there's like two, three percent of the mail-in ballots that have been rejected this year. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 percent. So it's definitely been an issue here locally. And whether people took the opportunity to get out and vote or not, there are local races that are going to impact all of us, especially when it comes to Bear County Judge. That's probably the biggest uh, local race to watch. What are you going to be paying close attention to there tonight? Well, I think on the Republican side, we we know, I mean, unless there's a big surprise in store for us, I think we anticipate that Trish DeBerry 
uh, who gave up her county commissioner seat to run for county judge will be the Republican nominee. Um, so a lot, the interest tends to be on the Democratic side. You have three major candidates. You've got Ian Mihadis, who's a state representative, uh, Peter Sakai, who uh, is a former district court judge, and Ivalice Mesa Gonzalez, who's been a, a political activist on the Democratic side and was, uh, until recently, the chief of staff for Mayor Ron Nuremberg. And um, it, it really is about as uh, wide open a race as any I can remember. And it's obviously, it has huge consequences for the county. First time we've had an open seat for this office in, in more than two decades. And um, I, it's, I think everyone's really uh, unsure about how this is gonna go. Are, do you have a gut feeling? Cause I, I've talked, I think I joked before we were on camera here that I've talked to, you can talk to three different people and you have three different favorites in that race. I mean, it really seems as if it's wide open. I have heard a lot of people say, okay, it's going to a runoff, Judge Sakai will be in, but then the other two between Ina and Ivelisse, it seems to be uh, neck and neck, at least of people that are guessing what's gonna happen. I think that's right. And I think you've, you've had a kind of interesting uh, difference in strategy. I think that, um, for example, I think on the uh, in the Peter Sakai campaign, I think that there's they've they've really been proud of what they feel has been sort of like a uh, retail uh, polit political effort. Uh, I think the uh, EME House campaign has has probably stressed uh, uh, you know getting mailers out and and digital uh, advertising maybe more than the other candidates. Um, but it's it's really hard to predict. They all have uh, you know strong resumes and uh, you know they all have. Uh, you know, they've all sort of built connections in the community over a long period of time, and it's it's uh, it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Let's zoom out a little bit to District 28 with the U.S. Uh, rep contest there. Henry Cuellar, obviously somebody who's held that position since 2005. Jessica Cisneros, mm -hmm. it was a close race the last time these two faced off, and then you throw in a raid by the FBI. So I'm curious what you think is going to play out tonight, especially how much the news of that raid uh, may impact Cuellar. I think my sense, uh, and it may have been a wrong one, but I, I think early on, I tended to feel that uh, Henry Cuellar may, may have been in a stronger position in this rematch. Uh, sometimes we see uh, candidates who do really well the first time around in, in challenging an incumbent, as Jessica Cisneros did two years ago. And in a rematch, uh, you see the incumbent is, is, is maybe better prepared for the challenge. Um, that was my just my gut feeling until fairly recently. And I think the FBI raid, um, even though we don't know a lot about, you know, where this is going to lead, and and uh, you know, it, it, I still think that it's it's got to hurt um, the congressman quite a bit. And and uh, you know, and, uh, Jessica Cisneros, I, I also think that in, when you have a low turnout election, that in this case it could benefit her because her her supporters are very passionate. She's a movement progressive. She's had Elizabeth Warren and Alexandria Ocasio Cortez coming uh, for uh, local rallies. So we know her supporters are going to turn out. And I think that in a small turnout election, uh, it could be beneficial to it. I want to talk quickly about uh, the Republican race for Lyle Larson's seat. He's not going to run for re-election, isn't running for re-election. Who do you think are the two that come out of the runoff there? Almost surely we're going to a runoff there. I think the candidate who kind of caught my attention the most is Adam Blanchard, who I was not that familiar with before this campaign. He's a trucking industry executive, a young candidate, very, uh, you know, I, I found him to be really uh, articulate and uh, uh, I was I was impressed with him. Uh, and I think that he's also, you know, done well on the fundraising side. Um, but I, I will say that, um, you know, people on the campaign team of a former councilwoman, Lisa Chant, are very confident. Um, and uh, I think that, again, we're probably looking at a runoff there. Um, and, and, and as with the county judge race, I think that, that this one is, uh, is also going to be really, uh, uh, you know, hard to predict. All right. Gilbert Garcia with the Express News, soon to be having his own show on KLRN with our friends over there. Talk a little bit about that before we let you go. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be a monthly uh, talk show called Texas Talk you know, with the idea that we want to have interesting people in politics, culture, uh, business, sports, you name it. And, and it'll be a 30 minute show, one on one conversation, hopefully just a really relaxed, uh, open conversation with uh, interesting people. Love yeah. it. Texas Talk, KLRN. Lots to talk about here in Texas. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully you still make time for us though too, Gilbert. So Absolutely. All right, good luck tonight. We'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you, take care. And we'll be right back.
Ukrainian President Zelensky speaking with President Biden by phone earlier today as he pleads with the West to do more to step in and help his country. Ukrainian officials say Russia is escalating attacks, changing their tactics by attacking from the air. ABC's Rena Roy with the latest. Russia escalating its attacks on Ukraine, hitting the main broadcast tower in Kyiv with a missile Tuesday. Ukrainian President Zelensky saying at least five were killed as the tower burst into flames. The tower is located near one of the most prominent Holocaust memorial sites in Europe. The memorial's board says it was also damaged in a strike. The Kremlin striking Ukraine's second largest city of Kharkiv, targeting its central square and an administration building. According to Ukrainian officials, killing several and injuring dozens more. Russian strikes are hitting schools, hospitals, residential buildings. They're destroying critical infrastructure. Just outside of Kyiv, a crater now right in the middle of what appears to be a neighborhood. A 40-mile Russian convoy still advancing on the capital city. Though a senior U.S. defense official says they appear bogged down, essentially in the same place for a day now. The Russians believed to be running out of food and fuel for their troops as they meet more resistance than expected. The official adds they could just be regrouping. They continue to, to want to move on Kyiv to capture Kyiv, to take Kyiv. Ukrainian President Zelensky says his country desperately needs help from the European Union, with Russian troops now increasing their airstrikes. <laughs> Zelensky met with a standing ovation from the EU's parliament, but says he needs to see that support put into action. <laughs> Adding Ukraine will fight more than anyone else, but left alone against Russia, they cannot manage. Meanwhile, Western diplomats walking out on Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's speech at the top UN Human Rights Forum. As sanctions continue to cripple Russia's economy, the U.S. and its allies are working together to release 60 million barrels of oil to help with the cost of fuel and to send a unified message to global oil markets that there will be no shortage of supplies as a result of this war. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Spider-Man may snag an Oscar. Spider-Man No Way Home is one of 10 movies up for the fan favorite Oscar this year. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences revealed the front runners for the award on social media. They say fans of these films have until Thursday to vote. They can either vote on the website OscarsFanFavorite.com or just tweet the Academy their pick using the hashtag OscarsFanFavorite. The 94th annual Oscar ceremony on March 27th, right here on KSAT 12. All right, today is National Peanut Butter Lovers Day. This is different than National Peanut Butter Day. That's January 24th. <laughs> today is for the fans of the creamier, crunchy spread, your choice. It's for those who enjoy it as a snack or need it in their desserts or like to experiment on new combinations with it. The National Day calendar says that Peanut Butter Lovers Day was started back in 1990 to commemorate the anniversary of Peanut Butter's commercial debut in the U.S. So this is a day to celebrate the people who like it. Is that what I'm getting? Not the food itself? What's the point? I, One and the same. I think it's just all, it's all the same spread. I was, I mean, I let you Waiting think there for, for a minute. <laughs> yeah. I knew it was going to be something good. Did that pause. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. Whatever, however you spread it. Yeah, okay. Let's talk weather. All right, yeah, yeah. I, need, yeah, I was waiting for you to like, are you going to weigh in on this He's peanut done. butter lover's He's day? Done. We're cutting them off right now. Okay. Are you going to weigh in on this? <laughs> nope, not going okay. to. All right. We don't even do these national we... days that much anymore. Yeah. Well, it is March 1st now. That's important meteorologically because that is the beginning to meteorological spring. Oh. Now, astronomical spring doesn't come till later on in the month, but meteorological spring for record keeping meteorologically March, April. In May. Let's take a look at our February temperature wise and it was 6.2 degrees below average. It was a overall a fairly cool February. Of course, we did have some warm days mixed in 85 degrees on the 21st and the 22nd, but the coldest was 21 and that was on February 4th. Here's a look at March though and what you can expect in terms of averages. The average low today 48, the average high 70 by the end of the month. 
the average low goes up to 55 and the average high is 77. Of course, we're on the upswing this time of year and we're also gaining more daylight as that sun is setting out there. Take a look at the, the almanac data today. 33 this morning, then a high temperature of 72 earlier today. The record high 89 set back in 1899. And you look at the readings right now, still comfortable and pleasant outside. But keep in mind, these temperatures will be dropping off pretty quickly and efficiently come nighttime and really just in the next couple of hours because of the dry air, clear sky and calm wind, good radiational cooling. So Divine now 67, Canyon Lake at 63 degrees, Kerrville 62 and Bandera at 67, Del Rio still hanging on to 73. By early tomorrow morning, most of us I think will be right near 40 degrees to start the day. Dew points are down and that's one reason why we cool off so effectively and efficiently at night. Dry air allows your temperatures to really fall off nicely at night, but then rise quickly during the day when combined with sunshine. Dew points will be on the rise. You'll actually notice some humidity and mugginess in the air by this upcoming weekend. But even before then, just an influx in the overall humidity levels going from the very dry air now to just slightly uh, well, not as dry air by Thursday. That's going to lead to some morning fog and a little bit of drizzle. And that's going to be a trend and a pattern Thursday morning all the way through Sunday morning. Every morning, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'll have that nuisance dampness and reduced visibility because of fog and drizzle, but no real good moisture coming out of it. Weak disturbance over Arizona. That's throwing some mid-level clouds our way, and especially just to the north of us. We're not going to get any rain from that, unfortunately. There's a stronger system that's throwing some energy and moisture on shore in the Pacific Northwest. And we're going to see an overall troughiness and big upper level dip in the pattern as we get later into this week and especially into next week. But I think the energy is mainly going to stay north of us. We just have a few slight rain chances coming down the pike. So let's talk about it here. 40 degrees tomorrow morning by the afternoon will be in the mid 70s. So long sleeves for the kids at the bus stop, but later on in the day, short sleeves, A-OK. -okay. Nothing but sunshine too and a, a light and variable wind. Hondo tomorrow morning, 39, Uvalde 37. For the most part, right around 40 degrees. Canyon Lake even 38. So we'll have some upper 30s out there, but then we all break into the 70s by the afternoon. Anywhere from 73 and Bernie to 75, Elmendorf and Castroville about 75 for the high. Saturday and Sunday with the added humidity in the air. I do think we'll also make it to about 80 degrees. The high temperature low 80s. We're predicting 81 Saturday and Sunday for the afternoon highs. And then you look ahead at those rain chances Sunday a 20% chance a cold front a week one hits on Monday with that a 30% chance of a few showers. Thank you, Adam. In case you missed it coming up next. It's Tuesday, March 1st. Well, still no arrest after a shooting on the city's northeast side. Police say just after 1230 this morning, a man was in his vehicle when someone in another vehicle started shooting at him. Police say a bullet hit the victim in the leg. He was taken to the hospital and should be OK. Before most people had opened their eyes, San Antonio police were opening up a murder investigation. They got the call around 1.30 this morning about a shooting in the 5500 block of Fredericksburg Road a parking lot near the Forest Ridge Apartments. Within seconds, police knew the reports were accurate, that two people had been shot. They found a 28-year-old man with a gunshot wound in his head. He was loaded into an ambulance for a trip to a hospital. The other victim, at first, was nowhere to be found. Somehow he went to the hospital in a private car. And police say he was suffering from a gunshot wound in his neck. In a deadly shooting from yesterday, a woman who was shot and killed in the 100 block of Inner Park Boulevard identified as 51 year old Maria Virginia Hernandez. The suspect, 54 year old Enrique Lada, we're told he is currently in custody in Mexico. With the deadly invasion inflicted by Russia on the Ukrainian people intensifying, the humanitarian crisis there is mounting as well. We've seen the fear and suffering playing out on those packed railway cars and in platforms crammed with thousands hoping to escape Ukraine. UNICEF saying that of the estimated 677,000 escaping to neighboring countries, more than half of them are children. Welcome back, and we are in the heart of the KSAT newsroom. 
right now, as we do most election nights, we are going to give you election results, reaction. We have candidates on hand. It is our election night breakdown 2022. We've got just a couple of minutes before the polls close at 7 o'clock. Of course, there's always, and we hope there are still people in line trying to get their votes counted when those polls close. As soon as we've got numbers, we're going to start going over those and talking about the biggest races to watch, the most interesting races, a big one being the race for Bear County Judge. Yeah, we also have the statewide races covered. Who will make the runoff when it comes to Attorney General for the state of Texas? Will the governor, will the lieutenant governor avoid runoffs in their own party's races? Those will be very interesting to watch. Uh, we have a, po a power panel that's going to be with us all night. Kevin Wolf, DeMonte Alexander, Molly Cox. We have Bear County Judge candidate former district judge Peter Sakai on hand. He will be one of our first interviews. And of course, numbers, numbers, numbers. <laughs> and what do you like to call this live stream? It's Every kind of election? like a it's kind of like a Wayne's World. <laughs> kind of like a Wayne's World political thing. Every yeah. election. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. Come check it out. Any streaming platform will join you here in just a few minutes, a few minutes after seven. See you then.